Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, you're probably sitting there wondering why on earth have these guys got a Formula One guy into an iGaming event. Um, but I hope what you're going to see over the next few minutes of me talking here is that there are a huge number of synergies in my world of Formula One and high performance elite racing to your world of online gaming. It might seem strange, but just bear with me. Um, what I actually want to talk about is how Formula One teams and the Formula One industry finds ways to maximize its performance and how it finds ways to differentiate itself as a team from the competitors, from the other teams on the grid. Um, so I'm going to explain how they do that and go through a period of time when my team, McLaren Racing, really found a kind of a way to unlock that extra performance to differentiate them from the, from the crowd. And well, let's start by having a quick show of hands of who follows the sport, who follows Formula One. Formula One fans in the room? OK, so not that many, which is great, because that means then the rest of you, I can tell you absolutely anything, and you just have to believe me. That's fine. Um, well, I want to start by talking about how Formula One teams, with their cars, the technology and the engines in those cars, how they find ways to unlock that maximum performance. Because those of you that don't necessarily follow the sport may not know that many of the Formula One teams, although they have very different cars, they often look very different, they're painted in different colors, many of them all use the same engines. There might be three, four or five teams that all use a Mercedes engine, for example. And those engines, in terms of their hardware, are identical to each other. So that means you've got pretty much the same performance sat behind you as a driver to the guy next to you on, your, on the other side of your own garage, but also to the other guys further down the pit lane that are competing against you in the same way. So how do you find a way to find some way of unlocking some extra performance for your guy, for your driver and your car in your team when everyone else might have the same? Because actually, in days gone by, we didn't really do that. We actually just gave the drivers the same car with that same engine and told them to go out onto the racetrack. And, and it was up to them then to just drive it as fast as they could and get the best out of it. But we realized at McLaren a number of years ago during a period of kind of reflection and a period of, of self-analysis where we were desperately looking for ways to improve our performance that, that actually, although we had the same hardware, as both drivers in our garage had the same, other teams had the same too. There are a number of ways that we could use that hardware differently to suit the individual that's sitting behind the wheel, because they might have very different needs. They might have different characteristics to the way they drive that car. And if we can tailor or customize our engine's performance or our car's performance to suit their individual character, their individual needs and their driving style, well, maybe we could unlock some even bigger performance that we may not have been doing up until that point. And so, because Formula One is this real detail-driven industry, where we focus on almost forensic levels of attention to detail, we started to do exactly that. We started to drill down into the detail of how we might be able to customize this engine. Not through the hardware, that was locked. You all had to have the same technology, but perhaps through software, through the way that engine operates, the way that it's used. And so we started to focus on our particular driver and analyze through lots of the data that we had access to from the various sensors all around our cars, looking at the differences between the way one driver operates and the way he might approach a corner or the way he might ap apply the throttle pedal or apply the brakes going into a corner, and how those differences, even though they might be tiny, minuscule differences, could be ways to set him apart from the guy in the same car just a little bit further down the pit lane. And when we started to drill down into that almost ridiculous level of detail, which is what it seemed like at the time, we did begin to find quite a few differences, quite a few things that made these drivers that on the face of it looked like they were doing exactly the same thing because they were driving around the same racetrack, they were braking at pretty much the same points into every corner, more or less they were applying the throttle on the way out of the corner at pretty much the same way, they were going at pretty much the same speeds. But Formula One is this industry that focuses on the very tiny details that set one apart from the other, the marginal gains. We're talking about thousandths of a second that can be the difference between one lap and another. And those thousands of a second can be the difference between winning a race or not, getting pole position or getting second. And they're important. So when we started to unlock these little, tiny, minute differences between drivers' needs, 
from when they were sat behind the wheel, we could then start to apply the technology and the way that technology operated to suit those individual characteristics. And I'm talking about starting to look at the way one driver approaches a corner. Because, of course, we used to set our car up and set our engine up for a particular racetrack, but everybody did that. That's what everybody does. You set it up slightly differently for each racetrack because they have slightly different characteristics of that circuit. But we started to then look at, well, how, do we, how could we tailor or customize our engine's performance, not just for an individual racetrack, but actually for individual corners around that racetrack? So at turn one, is the driver doing something maybe a tiny little bit different to another driver on the approach to turn one? And if he is, well, could we tweak the systems or the software in our car to deliver something a little bit different that might help that driver's unique style? And I'm talking about things like when the driver jumps on the brake pedal as he wants to slow down for a corner. There are systems on board our car that control electronically and hydraulically things like the differential in the back of the car between the two rear wheels. That can really impact the stability of the car going into the corner. And that can really change the way that the driver gets a, a feel from behind the wheel. And some drivers require a different feel, a different understanding of how their car's operating. And so when we started to look at a certain corner, let's say turn one, well, one particular driver might want a, a slightly more, we call it a locked differential, which might mean the car pushes on a little bit into the corner. It might understeer. The front end doesn't turn in quite so much, but that gives the driver a much more stable car through that corner. And some drivers prefer that kind of characteristic. Another driver might want a much looser differential, which might encourage oversteer or the rear wheels to, to spin up. But what we realized was that some drivers actually needed that because their style behind the wheel was that they used the throttle pedal to maybe spin the wheels up a little bit and that encouraged a little bit of oversteer or the back end to step out. And that's how they got the best of the car going through that corner. So by looking at individual corners around a lap, we started to be able to increase or change settings automatically on the approach to each of those corners. And that gave us a bit of an advantage over time because all of a sudden no one else was doing that, but our drivers had this unique capability now to tailor or customize the car and the car's performance to their needs. And once we started to realize that we were finding an advantage by individually looking at certain corners and how we could tailor that performance, well, then we started to delve even deeper into that. Because with the advent of much more advanced GPS systems, global positioning systems that could now really accurately find out where the car is on the circuit at any given moment in time, well, not only could we start to look at individual corners around a circuit, but we began to break that down even further into even more detail, giving the driver even more options, because now, using GPS, well, we know where the car is meter by meter around that entire lap of the racetrack. So not only can we set the car up differently for one corner, but actually we can focus on the elements of that corner, meter by meter. On the approach to that corner, we can have the engine delivering a certain level of performance. We can have the differential systems operating in a certain way. Two meters further on, we can tweak that because we know that our driver has a particular style that in the mid part of that corner, for example, well, he's doing something different behind the wheel to the guy in the same car on the other side of the garage. And when you focus on that level of detail, the driver, who for us is the end user of our product, has a huge number of options, a huge level of customization that they can constantly tweak with buttons and dials on the steering wheel to really optimize the experience behind the wheel for their particular needs. And when you drill down to that level of forensic detail and give that level of customization, well, the sky really is the limit on what we could achieve. And over that period of time, throughout that, that period of Formula One, where McLaren, ahead of everybody else, ahead of all of our competitors, had started to unlock this extra level of performance, even though we had exactly the same hardware, the same technology, we began to create a significant advantage for ourselves. And by doing that, we started to win races. We started to have more performance and get more success. And of course, this process leads on to other people starting to emulate what you do. They start to realize that, well, McLaren must have something different. They must be doing something different. They delve into what you're doing, and eventually, naturally, other people begin to start to copy and do similar things themselves. And you then have to be looking for the next level of detail that you can go to that might set you apart from that competition. 
Now, of course, going through the process of customizing the car's onboard systems, the engine, the differential, and that kind of thing, led on to us thinking in the same way about the rest of what we do at McLaren. And we began to look at everything we do in that same level of customizable attention to detail. And I want to leave you in a moment with a video that uh, I think sums up what we did in that period of time. Because whilst we looked at the engine and everything else, we started to look at the human performance. We started to look at pit stops. The element of a Formula One Grand Prix where the car rushes into the pit lane and the guys change the wheels and tires in just four seconds as it was back then. Incredibly rapid, but that's what everybody was doing. And when we started to delve down into detail and customize the equipment and the process to the people doing the job, the people using that equipment, the pit stop crew, well, we began to find some incredible advantages too. So it transformed our entire business. And I want to leave you with this little video, which really shows where we got to off the back of a four second pit stop, which was the best anybody could do, which is blisteringly quick. Well, we got to what you're about to see here, which was a dramatic improvement. Let's see the video. It's quite incredible when you see it happening in front of you, isn't it? How we had to focus on such details. And when I'm talking about customization, I'm talking about customizing the whole process, the equipment, so the tools, the jacks, the guns, but also the process of where people are standing and what body movements they're making during that what is just a handful of seconds, less than two seconds now, we and the entire Formula One industry now, because as I said, everybody starts to catch up, have transformed those pit stops into they're over in a flash. And it only happens through attention to detail and being able to customize your products and your processes to suit the end user. And that is where I hope you'll see the huge synergies in what we do in Formula One and what you do in the iGaming industry. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mark Priestley. My goodness. That was absolutely incredible. I love that video, every detail. It happens so quickly, you know, and uh, I'm, it gives me great pleasure to hand over from one fast-moving industry to another. And now we're going to have a keynote presentation by the Chief Product Officer at iSoftBet. Please give a warm round of applause to Andrew Bonici. Thank you. Thank you. Some amazing insights there from Mark and, of course, our industries are not the same. But I do believe the value of customization is something that they both share. By now, you're probably wondering how the hell I'm going to tie what he said with our world. And over the, the rest of the session, I hope I'll manage to do just that. Over the next few minutes, I'll be discussing gamification and engagement tools and the strategic value they can bring to drive player uh, loyalty and increased engagement. In 2021, people online expect and demand a certain level of experience. Whether they're shopping, browsing, watching YouTube, listening to music, watching Netflix, or even gambling online, they demand and expect a smooth, snappy, personalized experience from the moment they sign up to a platform to consuming its content. If they don't get this experience, they're ready to move on. These same individuals are our players. They're the players playing our games, consuming our content. So it's absolutely essential that as an industry, we provide the same level of experience that they can find elsewhere and online. What you see behind me is the typical engagement tools. Actually, in the industry, we refer to them sometimes as CRM tools, marketing tools. They range from the more straightforward free spins to tournaments, achievements, more complex network jackpots, cash drops, uh, real-time triggers, real-time overlays. They're serving the same purpose. They're offering the casino a tool to enhance the player experience, to add that sense of progression and added value to the player. It's absolutely essential that we embed these mechanics within the gameplay itself and not outside. Let's be clear, the player will play the game and continue playing if they enjoy it, 
not just because there's a mechanic like this. However, it does extend the life cycle and the lifetime of that player and therefore drive retention. At ISOFBET, we've recently run a set of focus groups. We had a couple of demographics, and we asked them a few questions, trying to understand what they want from us, what they're looking for when they go online. There was a couple of themes that came out really clearly for us. Firstly, that we need to customize our offering to their specific needs, and also to give them a choice. As I said, we had a couple of demographics, an older one and a younger one, but they both gave us the same relevant feedback. They want to be rewarded as they play. They want to be rewarded according to their spending power and patterns. And they want to be given the choice of when to claim that reward. The younger demographic actually was fairly interesting. They're fairly skeptical about the online gaming world in general. They look at it and they're very wary of any mechanic that's trying to make them play more. They're obviously a bit more savvy around certain things, but one thing they did mention is they're very much intrigued by this sense of progression, of working towards something as you play across gameplay sessions, across games. Amongst this insight and others, for us, what it told us is that whatever tools and products that we build, they need to be able to be customizable and configurable so that we deliver according to their specific personal needs. If we just zoom out a bit and look at other industries, we look at the other big tech giants, um, you'll see that over the last 10, 15 years, they've really drilled this into an art form. They understand that these engagement mechanics are what's driving the player retention, repeat purchases, platform loyalty. We see it all around. You can see around Spotify that every year they're giving us the uh, summarized playlist. Uh, every December, they promptly embarrass me, reminding me I've listened to way too much Enrique Iglesias, <laughs> or the infamous Netflix and Amazon recommendation engines. And also Xbox and PlayStation with their achievements framework. Actually, the video game world is absolutely fascinating to look at the evolution over the last 10 years. It used to be a simple business model, they used to develop a game, package it, sell it in retail, and move on to the next game. Over the years, it very clearly changed into an engagement mechanic, where they're trying to keep the players over a period of months and years. They've come up with various mechanics, such as monthly subscriptions, seasonal passes, microtransactions, loot boxes. All of these are mechanics that the video game world is trying to enhance that retention of the player and keep them playing the same game for months and years. When you look at their quarterly revenue retrospectives, they're all talking about the KPI MAU, monthly active users. What this KPI is, is actually essential for them, for their business model, because they, they've moved from actual financial sales on their retail packages to actually tracking the engagement of their players. At ISOFBET, we've been working over the past years on our aggregation platform. We offer a set of ISOFBET games as well as third-party aggregation content. We believe we need to offer a holistic service, and we've been working very hard to build new and refactor existing tools. Actually, recently, we've, we're in the process of re-releasing our in-game achievement and uh, tournament tool. We've been very successful over the summer with one of our partners, Saska, in Czech Republic. They've run a sequence of tournaments, actually running our in-game tool over the third-party content. We're also in the process of releasing a real-time personalization tool that's actually looking within the mechanics of the game, looking at win and loss streaks, and looking at player patterns across sessions and across games. The premise of the platform is to build a set of tools that can be offered to our partner operators and that are highly configurable and customizable so that we can tailor-make it for their specific needs. We bring all these mechanics within our widget framework to ensure that they're all set and delivered within the game itself. We're really happy and proud to announce that we've re we're releasing a product that really builds onto these concepts.
love that video. I'm guessing and hoping that now you might see the hook in the first session. <laughs> Bit of a long shot, but I think it works. We're offering a jackpot tool. Yes, there are many out there, but we truly believe that our tool is the most flexible in the industry. We really want it to be able to be highly configurable and customizable so that we can work closely with our partner operators and tailor it for their specific markets, their specific customer base, and their specific needs. We offer a set of progressive, multi-level, event, and time-based jackpots that can be run in parallel or targeting specific VIPs on the platform. We have an inbuilt dashboard which can be used to monitor real-time liability. Amongst the number of other configuration and customization options, we allow the operator to run it on one site or multiple sites, as well as choose the specific RTP of the game that they want to run the jackpots on. Of course, it comes inbuilt with our native jackpot widgets, which are fully customizable, both in design and in size. Overall, the concept here is a fully customizable and configurable platform. In phase one of our launch with several operators, we've seen a big success on player engagement metrics, such as average spins, average bet per spin, number of players, number of games these players are playing. We're very excited to work with our partners over the next few months to help them assist, handhold them, all the way from setting up this jackpot to the launch. Over the next few months, we'll also be releasing a number of new prize and jackpot structures, including our very own cash drop. To summarize and conclude, I really want to emphasize our belief and concept in this customization. I really do think that platform and game providers can unlock this ability with operators to really enhance the player experience. As an industry, especially if we use more advanced data and machine learning techniques, we can really enhance and deliver the superior customer experience that these players find online in other segments. Thank you for your time. Ladies, wonderful. What a presentation, what a launch. I like it, I feel lucky to be here. Okay, <laughs> but Andrew, we're gonna give you a rest for a few minutes and we're gonna come over to our VIP panelists. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, I got a couple of questions that tie in a bit to what Andrew was just talking about there. <laughs> Coming to your good self first, Kira. welcome to the stage. What do you consider a successful player engagement tool? What's your take? So I think for me, I mean, there is no simple answer. If someone tells you it's a single tool, then that is the wrong answer. You know, I think very much in line with the presentation. We have over a million customers every quarter on our platform. And for every customer that plays to level up, you have a customer who wants to see nothing at all in their game. And for every customer who plays a game that's highly volatile, looking for that big life-changing win, you also have a customer who wants a win every three, four, five spins and, and doesn't want to take that hit. So for me, a customization tool has to be micro-targeted, it has to be relevant, and it needs to be real-time for the customer in-game, because the days of customers lowering their balance or having big wins, and then you sending them an email tomorrow are, are long gone, and the casinos who are still working like that are, are not going to be around for very much longer. Yeah, absolutely. Wise words there. We live in an era of uh, mass, sorry, hyper-personalization. I totally agree. And uh, same question to yourself, Aaron. I'd love to get the William Hill take on what do you consider a successful player engagement tool? Yeah, I think there's two sides to this. You've got your time staff CRM manager who's terrified on a Friday afternoon trying to get a campaign out. They need real-time feedback of the risk analysis of what they're setting up. And, and that sort of exists in some of our bigger platforms, but it's not that obvious. Um, and then you find out historically on Monday morning that you know, it didn't go so well. Um, so for those guys who might not know very technically or mathematically inclined, you know, they need to see that visually. You know, this, this campaign works, it's going to work with these games. Almost a live QA test of the campaign. Um, from, the, from the player side, you know, the, the, we've got the, you know, those tool set, you've got your lucky wheel, you get tournaments, you've got the various you know, jackpot drops and whatnot. Um, that's great. You put anything in front of them, they'll play it, they'll, they'll have a go at it. But what we, where we see the real upticks is if it is seasonal, if it is you know, empathetic to the, 
to the player, you know, is it Easter? Is it, you know, is it the Grand National? Um, you know, for us, we've got retail as well. So, so that touch point, the added touch point, really gives an answer. So if we do a deal with a game provider, and it's in the retail as well as in, on, you know, on the, on the sort of the, the line on mobile, and, and that tournament's carrying on, you know, it, it, the engagement is, we see a marked uplift in engagement. So yeah, that's really sort of, you know, the, they're the simple sides of it um, that I see. Yeah. Great answer, thank you so much. And um, I have another big question for the both of you, so I'm very glad you're here to answer it. Uh, I'm going to start with yourself, Kira. What do you think will be the single biggest player engagement innovation over the next five years? Definitely not an easy question, I think. And <laughs> if I knew the answer, I think I'd, I'd probably start a bidding war here today. We've got all the biggest <laughs> big buyers in the industry out there. I mean, for me, it, it, it follows on from that question. I think there's still an awful lot that our industry can learn from social gaming and, and from a lot of the other industries out there. And for me, it is about that micro-targeting and, and those individual moments. You know, every customer, whether you can group them or put them in different demographics, they have an individual reason for play and a driver that, that goes behind them. So I think one single player engagement model might be absolutely good if you've got strong enough AI and machine learning people in your organization, but one mechanic itself will not be good enough for everybody. And I think it's about having something that gives consistency to the players, and which is why we really like working with aggregators like iSoftBet, because it allows us not only to take their own content, but also the content we aggregate and offer that level of consistency across a number of providers, which is really important to us. Mm. Absolutely, micro-targeting is such a key point. And same question to yourself, Aaron, what do you think will be the single biggest player engagement innovation in the next five years? Yeah, so there's, a, there's an immediate point where we need to draw on the data we're getting from these campaigns to create engagement. You know, there's these forced breaks now for RGE, you know, that this is where the player can, you know, indulge in their data and, and look at how they did. But more, the big thing for me is, um, is, is these intrinsic motivators are going to become more extrinsic. So, so where, you, where we're giving people points and they're, you know, getting, getting sort of leveling up as such, it'll become more of a financial thing. And I think, you know, sorry for the buzzword, but, you know, the NFT is right in place there. Um, you know, I could visualize like the, the affiliate taking a step into the fold here and actually, you know, being the onboarding process and helping us with the onboarding process and you know us you know the likes of iSoft that using an NFT asset value which is useful across all the ecosystems so mm -hmm. so big time gaming have one and it all it's all you know congruent with, with the same process but in, in 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 the process of onboarding say a big affiliate if you've got money out there please do it um, you know they, they they can KYC the guys they can take the deposit they can do their source of funds these are the things where we're losing players today you know because they can't be bothered with this but if all of that entertainment and all of this is you know on casino grounds for example and and, and you know there's a motivator to get on there this is the kind of player I am this is what I want to do there's my license blah 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 and they've got a gold mine of data that we then go to a trading floor and decide who we want, you know, and who we want to buy and who we want to engage. And I think that, that you know, that's the, that's the future. I've been going on about this for five years, but hopefully this is the next five years. <laughs> Fantastic answer. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to hand over to yourself, Andrew, if you've any closing remarks. We're coming a bit close to time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, how are you going to kind of wrap everything up? No, just a quick one is for us to keep in mind as well that the generation of players is changing. Mm. We're in the cusp of a new generation coming on, and the way they consume the content, the way they look at things, is different to what we're used to. So we need to keep pace with that and ensure that we're delivering the right tools. Of course, from our end, as a platform provider, one of the main things we want to do is work actually with the operators hand in hand to develop these tools and understand what their needs are. So overall, I think, for sure, as an industry, we can keep working at improving and delivering these engagement tools and keeping pace with the changing player base. Absolutely. Well said. Absolutely brilliant. Next generation tools for the next generation of iGamers. I love it. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is all we have time for. I want you to please join me in giving a big thanks to our rock star speakers and panelists, Andrew Bonici, Kira Nicliam, and Aaron Lowe. And a big thanks to Mark Priestley as well. Thank you so much. That was absolutely great. Cheers. Thank you.